and hopefully we'll be able to take away um, some key take home messages from not just why, but how we look at asymmetry, which sounds like a really vague and ambiguous statement to begin with. But by the end of the presentation, I'm hoping that will become clearer. The other thing we'll focus on today, and there is a specific reason for that, will be why we also use jump tests to determine um, asymmetry or side to side differences or interlimb differences. And you'll often hear me refer to asymmetry as you know, imbalances, side to side differences, interlimb differences, all these different terms. And I'm just, I'm using these terms interchangeably to mean the same thing. And for probably no other reason, just to avoid saying asymmetry five times in the same sentence over and over again. Okay. Um, so it's just a little bit of an outline. I think the best thing I've found, you know, as I deliver more of these presentations on this topic is to just do a a quick slide at the beginning on something called operational definitions. And that's so we get everybody is on the same page before the presentation truly starts as to what it is that we're looking at and some of the analysis that we describe um, in some of these papers and research studies we've done. So as Felipe pointed out, we'll then look at what some of the research is saying about change of direction asymmetry. Um, and it won't just be about looking at the metric of total time or time to complete the test, which is what we've often historically seen in the literature. We'll be looking a little bit more at, um, I guess, some strategy-based metrics with the change of direction and deceleration deficit, um, which in the grand scheme of sports science research and strength and conditioning research are quite new and novel. Then we'll move on to the use of jump tests to measure asymmetry and why we would use jump tests before then looking at um, the importance of longitudinal and repeated measure study designs. Now, the reason we don't look at that for change of direction speed so much is because there haven't been as many studies on a repeated measure study design that have looked at COD asymmetry in the same way. And then we'll kind of round it up with a few take home messages, okay, to ensure or, or to encourage you to think about how we can use asymmetry data wisely. So slide one or part one, if you like, is just a single slide and it's our operational definition slide. So interlim asymmetry, we define as the difference in performance or function of one limb relative to the other. Now the word performance is usually used in athletic or physical performance-based studies, and the word function is usually used in injury-based studies when referring to asymmetry. The other thing to draw upon there is interlim is a description of comparing my left to my right, or my dominant to my non-dominant, or my injured to my healthy limb, and not to be confused with intra-limb asymmetry, which would focus on an imbalance within the same limb such as quadricep or hamstring ratios within the same leg. So this presentation will focus on interlimb differences between left and right or dominant, non-dominant. Then the magnitude of asymmetry, our second definition there, doesn't really um, need, a, need a definition per se. You know, asymmetry is just a percentage value comparing the difference between the two limbs. And it's that percentage value that we refer to as the magnitude. For example, if I jump 25 centimeters on my right leg, I jump 20 centimeters on my left leg, I have an absolute difference of five centimeters. That is a relative percentage difference of 20%, which is my magnitude of asymmetry. Okay. The third one is the direction of asymmetry. And what this refers to is which limb scores better out of the two to then report that relative percentage difference, that magnitude of asymmetry. So in that example I just gave you, 25 and 20 on my right and left legs respectively, we have a 20% asymmetry, but we say that the direction of asymmetry favours the right-hand side. And the reason we say it favours the right-hand side, not the left-hand side, is because in something like a jump test, the desired outcome is always the larger value, not the smaller value. Okay, so that gives you context 
to the magnitude of asymmetry, i.e. which limb is outperforming or better performing out of the two. And then lastly, the Kappa coefficient is a method of statistical analysis. And uh, I, I definitely don't want to make this a stats lecture, um, but it's something you can actually do in Microsoft Excel. You don't need R or Jamovi or SPSS. You don't need a software program to do it. I've done a video on YouTube and I've put the link at the end of this presentation for you to go and watch it if you want to, how you can calculate the Kappa coefficient. And what essentially we're looking at is um, how consistently the direction of asymmetry is on the same limb. So if I have two test sessions, test session one and test session two, if I jumped higher on my right limb in test session one, do I also jump higher on my right limb in test session two? Now, intuitively, people think, well, yeah, probably, but actually our research has shown that there's quite a lot of fluctuations in that direction of imbalance. So being able to statistically quantify these levels of agreement by virtue of this Kappa coefficient enables us to determine what is um, consistently an asymmetry to the same side and what is maybe what we would call fluctuations in natural performance variability. Hopefully that makes sense, that last statement, okay? Um, so let's get cracking with the rest of the presentation. And the first thing, you know, is to try and understand why we should be interested in looking at asymmetry during COD actions. So if you look at some brief time motion analysis data, we know that there's a lot of kicking, a lot of high intensity repeated actions and an awful lot of change of direction movements in soccer. And often this is the case in other team sports as well. And so a lot of these movement patterns occur at least partially, some of them entirely unilaterally. So they also are unlikely to occur in an equal amount on each limb. So it's highly unlikely that you will change direction the same amount of times on your left leg as your right leg. And that's because there are so many uncontrollable factors in team sports because you are playing opponents and you can't always predict what they do. Similarly, for something like kicking, you always have a preferred kicking limb. And then actually there's also positional differences in team sports and soccer is a good example. So with unequal loading on each limb and positional differences, we probably expect asymmetries to develop in these types of athletes. And those factors will exacerbate or magnify these asymmetries being developed, perhaps more on one side to the other. And there's a really, really nice study by uh, Dr. Nick Hart in 2016, which basically just described how asymmetry is a byproduct of competing at the same sport over an extended period of time. And that's what you'd expect because there's very similar movement patterns that are synonymous with a given sport. As we've presented here in football, you know, all players kick the ball, all players accelerate, all players have to change direction a lot. And when that's not done in an equal amount and positional differences exist, you're expecting asymmetries to develop as a product of playing the sport. So that's probably why we're interested in looking at asymmetry during change of direction speed tasks, okay? So if we go back to a bit of water, sorry. If we go back to some of the historical means of gathering data from change of direction speed tasks, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're typically only really interested in total time historically, like how fast can I complete the test? Yeah, whether it's an L run, a pro agility, the Illinois agility test, the 505 test, whatever the test might be. Now, if we're interested in asymmetry, the only way we can gather asymmetry historically would be if there were, we were able to get time to complete the test off of both my left and right legs. So that would be the only way that we could historically gather asymmetry data. And then what we've more recently started to look at is uh, Professor Sophia Nymphius 
has come up with something called the change of direction deficit. Okay, and that uh, I think she came up with this in 2013 in a paper using American football athletes, which is basically the time taken to run the 505 test, which is a, a graphic of that above these bullet points. And then you subtract the time taken to run the same measured distance, but in a linear sprint. So you can see when I do the 505 test, I start on that left-hand side where it says start line and zero meter timing gates. I sprint forward until I hit the 15 meter line, but the timing gates in a 505 test will only start and kick in at the 10 meter point. So what I'm measuring is actually the distance from here to here and back again. Hopefully you can see my cursor moving when I do that. That's the distance you're measuring in the 505 test. This is just a run up, okay, or a build up of speed. So you don't actually need timing gates for a 505 test at zero. What we do need is timing gates here for the deceleration deficit metric, which is something that is new and been created by a colleague of mine, Richard Clark, um, back in 2019. And this is essentially the time taken to run th this distance here, okay, that full 15 meter distance, we put an opto jump or a contact mat down so that athletes can plant their foot and we can measure how long their foot is in contact with the ground. And then basically we add on 50% of ground contact time, which is also measured in time or seconds. We add that on to our 15 meter time and then we subtract the time it takes to run a 15 meter linear sprint, okay? And that gives us a little bit more indication of an athlete's ability to actually change direction and actually decelerate. That's what we're looking at for the COD deficit and the deceleration deficit. And the reason we're interested in that data is because Sophia Nymphius, when she created the COD deficit, was first telling everyone, well, you know, the time it takes to complete a change of direction speed test is a very gross measure of changing direction. And essentially, an athlete can be rubbish at changing direction, but really, really good at accelerating in a straight line. And that can mask how good they are or how bad they are at actually changing direction which is why we're now interested in these more strategy and isolated base metrics of changing direction and deceleration. So I think there's still a lot more we need to know about how we change direction, but these are a good start, okay? And because in the 505 test, I run up, I plant my left leg, I run back, and then I plant my right leg and I run back, we can, of course, get asymmetry data for time, COD deficit and deceleration deficit. And we're now going to present you a couple of studies that uh, have looked at that stuff. So we said that Sophia Nymphius um, came up with the COD deficit. I think the application of the COD deficit to assess asymmetry was first done by a friend of mine called Tom Dos Santos, who also works here in the UK, up in Manchester in the north. Um, this is 43 team sport athletes. And what this graph is showing you is 505 time asymmetry, which is these darker bars, and 505 change of direction deficit asymmetry. He's just used the word imbalance instead. Okay. And what we notice, he's also put this threshold, which I, we won't talk about that just now. We'll just focus really on the, the individual bars for each athlete. So what we see here is individual asymmetry data for these two metrics. The first thing I notice is that instead of presenting mean data, Thomas presented individual data, which is really, really useful. It presents much more transparent information on the results, which is useful. And the reason why that's especially important for asymmetry is because as you can see, these bars are of very, very different sizes, which means the magnitude of asymmetry is very different from person to person. So it's a highly individualized 
concept. The second thing we notice is that Tom's graph, and this is something we've always done, has presented a symmetry data and given us the direction of the imbalance. So any bars above zero means that these athletes are faster on their right side, and any below zero means they're faster on their left-hand side. So not only do we have individual magnitude, we have the direction of asymmetry as well, which is really, really useful. And then the third thing to draw upon here is if we focus just on the darker gray bars, you'll see that actually they look quite small, don't they? As if this athlete here, number 22, looks like he's got an asymmetry of about 10% for the darker gray bar. This athlete, number 39, maybe 8%, something like that. You can't tell exactly from a graph. But then if we look at the COD deficit asymmetry, you'll notice that the bars are much, much bigger. Okay? Much, much bigger. Now, this led Tom um, to suggest that the change of direction deficit is more sensitive at detecting asymmetry. And Sophia Nymphius read this and thought it was an excellent suggestion. I have a different opinion, which I'm going to give to you now. Okay. Um, and ultimately, I said I didn't want to make it a stats lecture, but the reason that time and change of direction deficit differ so much in the magnitude of asymmetry is purely down to mathematics. And I'll explain it in two slides time. Okay. Here's a study we recently published, and this is with Irinu, okay, who Felipe knows well. Um, and uh, sorry, the other thing, if I go back, this is in college athletes, right? So the other thing we could suggest is that this isn't a particularly homogenous sample because it's different sports included to get the sample size up. But the sample's not entirely homogenous. These are professional rugby players, so we have a much more homogenous sample here, okay? And we've divided our results into forwards and backs. Now, we've presented asymmetry data. So this is the same graph as what Tom presented. I'm just calling it asymmetry instead of imbalance. It's the same thing. Anything above zero, the asymmetry favors the right leg. Anything below zero, the asymmetry favors the left leg. We are not only have 505 time, and change of direction deficit, which is what Tom had. We've also now got deceleration deficit asymmetry data, okay? And we've kind of color-coded it there, hopefully a little clearer than Tom did, okay? Right, what do we need to say about this graph? Well, the same as Tom, 505 time, how quickly I complete the 505 test, the size of the bars are very small, aren't they, compared to some of the others? They're pretty low, generally speaking. Generally speaking as well, if you look at the middle gray color, our change of direction deficit asymmetry, these bars are huge, yeah, in comparison to 505 time, and that's exactly what Tom found. And then deceleration deficit, bar one or two athletes, which is number one and number eight, the deceleration, and number 14, sorry, the deceleration deficit asymmetry tends to be smaller than the change of direction deficit asymmetry, but it also tends to be bigger than the 505 asymmetry, okay? So we're now really starting to try and analyze this data in a much more meaningful and individualized manner by looking at it this closely. The other thing that I wanna draw your attention to is that a lot of the time, the direction of asymmetry is pretty much the same for all metrics, but not always, which is why we need to look at this on an individual level. Take athlete eight, 505 time, right limb dominant, change of direction deficit, right limb dominant, deceleration deficit, left limb dominant. Same for athlete seven, same for athlete 24, same for athlete 19. So there are individual differences, which if we don't look at this stuff, we are missing some of what's going on for certain athletes within our sample. And given that these are professionals, that's really important that we don't miss that, those key changes in our data. Because one of the biggest challenges for any practitioner in professional sport is individualizing training programs 
based off of data that you collect in a group environment. It's a hard thing to do to individualize training when you're working with large groups of professional athletes. And this helps us contextualize that information. Okay, here's the maths bit. Bear with me, okay? I think it's, I'm biased, but I think it's worth understanding. Okay, I've given you hypothetical data here. This is not real. But the principle of what I'm gonna describe is exactly the same for any data that you collect because the equations in these columns are constant. The equation never changes. It's the numbers that go into the equation that change. Okay, so this is how we would calculate asymmetry for total time in a 505 test. They ran 2.5 seconds on their right leg and 2.4 seconds on their left leg. And this is the formula we put it into. Um, and, and if we need to be, we can discuss equations, which I've done a few papers on, um, and, you know, later on or at the end. This equates to a 4% asymmetry. Here's some more hypothetical numbers. And this equates to 9.1% asymmetry for this athlete, and so on and so on. Now, when I work out the COD deficit, the first thing I need to do before I look at COD deficit asymmetry is I need to subtract my 10 meter time from the 505 time, okay? And that's how we get our COD deficit numbers. So 2.5 minus 1.5 gives me one on my right leg. 2.4 minus 1.5 gives me 0.9 on my left leg. Now I dump those numbers into my asymmetry equation and my asymmetry is now 10, not four. And if you follow that principle, okay, for these three athletes, just look at how the magnitude differs for each athlete between time and COD deficit, four and 10. 9.1 uh, asymmetry percentage for time and 25 for COD deficit, 3.7, 6.7, 12 and 30. And here's our means. And again, a mean value is probably meaningless with only four athletes, but to make the point, we've got an average asymmetry of just under 5% and an average asymmetry for COD deficit of nearly 18%. And here is why, okay? I'm hoping it's obvious why, but I will uh, do my best to walk that horse to the water. So here we have a difference between right and left of 0.1, okay? 0.1 seconds relative to 2.5 seconds, which is my denominator, is 4%. I also have an absolute difference of 0.1 here because the difference between 1.0 and 0.9 is 0.1. However, 0.1 relative to 1 instead of 2.5 is 10%. So the reason you always get a larger asymmetry value for the COD deficit and not total time is because you are dealing with smaller raw numbers in the equation. And that means that percentages are biased towards smaller numbers in the formula, okay? And that's why it will always produce larger asymmetry values, the COD deficit. So what we wrote in our previous study, this one, is that people should not get sucked into chasing perfect symmetry for a metric like the COD deficit, because the numbers are always smaller than what you see for something like total time. It's actually really difficult to figure out exactly how you would use asymmetry data during change of direction speed tests, because we've written in a few papers that we don't think total time is a particularly sensitive metric for detecting asymmetry because mean values um, are often very, very low. So people look very symmetrical when you use total time to calculate asymmetry. And that's probably because total time is a very gross measure of doing change of direction speed. It doesn't give you any indication of strategy or how they performed the test. In the same way that jump height has been criticized uh, in jump testing for us needing to understand more biomechanical and strategy-based variables. Whereas for the COD deficit, because we're now dealing with smaller raw numbers, which will result in a larger percentage difference all the time, it makes it look like you can almost never get 
a symmetrical athlete when you use this metric. And so um, if historically lots of research has said, oh, you know, if you're 15% asymmetrical or you're 10% asymmetrical, you're more likely to get injured, um, which I promise you, you don't want to get me started on. It's such a flawed concept, drives me crazy. Um, you know, but if, if people live and die by that rule of 10% or 15%, then a lot of athletes, according to this particular metric, would be at a much greater risk of injury. But I think that's a little bit of a flawed concept, okay? And, and perhaps if anyone has a question at the end, we can talk about that in more detail. So this has led us to kind of understand that, well, if one metric deficit is really overly sensitive and almost gives a false impression of how big asymmetry is and time is not sensitive enough well maybe we should look at other means of looking at asymmetry okay so this is a study i've done with uh, carlos balsalabra who um, is the guy that designed a lot of those apps like my jump and cod timer things like that and my lift and what we've done here is we just did a test retest design, okay, 72 to 96 hours apart, something like that. And we measure single leg counter movement jump, single leg drop jump, height and reactive strength index, and change of direction speed time just with Carlos's apps. So this wasn't force plates or anything like that. This is smartphone application measurement. And we've got raw scores, and we calculate the asymmetry for both sessions as well. And then we've got our effect sizes for normative and non-parametric data here. Now, what do we notice? Well, if we just focus on the asymmetry data on the right-hand side of the table, it kind of follows on from what I previously said. These are our mean asymmetry values for change of direction speed, 505 time. You can see that these athletes are almost perfectly symmetrical if you use 505 time as your metric of interest. However, when the jump test they produce, generally speaking, much larger magnitudes of asymmetry. So this has enabled us to kind of draw upon this notion that if you're interested in looking at asymmetry or imbalances, we also probably want to be interested in tests that are sensitive at being able to detect that an imbalance is there in the first place. Hopefully that makes sense. And you can see that these magnitudes are much bigger compared to 505 time. The other thing that we should draw upon, it's really important actually, is two things. Number one, look at the standard deviations, which is the second number after every mean value, yeah? So the standard deviation of 10.64 average asymmetry is 8.56. Now, if we look at this here, if you compare the standard deviation for asymmetry compared to the standard deviation of the performance metric, you'll notice, hopefully, it's much, much, much different. So this represents roughly sort of 35, 40% of the mean. This is 80% of the mean, okay? You look here, even when the magnitude of asymmetry is small, the standard deviation is massive. Yeah, this is about 75% of the mean. This here is, again, about something like 70, 75% of the mean value. And you'll see this is nearly 90% of the mean value, okay? What does a large standard deviation mean? It means that you have an awful lot, a great deal of within group variation in your results. Typically, it means it's a noisy metric. OK, and that's something that's really important to understand, especially when you're looking for differences OK, between test sessions, of which in this example, there weren't any. The other thing this doesn't show us for these metrics is the direction of asymmetry. OK, so let me tell you now about I was speaking about using the Kappa coefficient to look at consistency in the direction of the imbalance. Well, let's have a look at what that looked like for our national level basketball players in this study okay so this is the same study and now i'm going to present you the individual data so this is cod asymmetry all right now the dotted lines represent um the coefficient of variation 
okay? And the coefficient of variation is being, or the between session coefficient of variation. And the coefficient of variation is a measure of absolute reliability. And what that enables us to do is any athlete that has a bar bigger or above the dotted line in either direction means that the asymmetry is larger than the error in the test. And that's a way of establishing that an asymmetry is real rather than within the noise of the test, if that makes sense. Secondly, let's look at the scale. You can see that the scale on the left-hand side is not very big. So these asymmetries almost never go above 10% ever, pretty much. This athlete is the only one. This is why we get magnitudes of asymmetry as a mean value, only around 3%, okay? The other thing is when we looked at the direction of asymmetry and looked at these kappa coefficients, the kappa coefficient was 0.29. Now, the kappa coefficient is like a correlation. It can go from minus 1 to plus 1. Anything less than 0 means that levels of agreement are very poor. 0 to 0 0.2 means that levels of agreement are slight. 0.21 to 0.4 equals fair. 0.41 to 0.6, moderate. 0.61 to 0.8, uh, substantial. And 0.81 to 0.99, nearly perfect. And one obviously is perfect. So 0.29 is not very good. And what does that mean in a practical perspective if we look at the individual data? It basically means if you want to have an indication of how good Kappa coefficient will be, or whether the direction of asymmetry is consistent, what you're looking for is how often these bars between test sessions are pointing in the same direction for each subject. So you can see number one in session one favored the left leg, but actually in session two favored the right leg. Consistent, 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 fluctuates. Consistent, consistent, fluctuates, 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 and so on and so on. There's about 12 athletes out of 30 here, 505 change of direction speed time, that fluctuate between test sessions, which is quite a lot, 12 out of 30. Now let's look at single leg counter movement jump height. Told a very, very similar story in terms of the direction of asymmetry. Kappa was 0.18, okay, so it was, uh, you know, pretty bad again. Lots unaccounted for. But the magnitude's much different. That scale goes all the way up to positive and negative minus 40. So we're now seeing larger imbalances being detected in the single leg counter movement jump test compared to the uh, 505 change of direction speed test. And the last one is jump height for the single leg drop jump. Now, what we see here, again, the graph looks a little different. The magnitudes are large, again, like the single leg counter movement jump. But this time, the Kappa coefficient was 0.72. We only had four athletes in the whole group who fluctuated or swapped sides in their asymmetry or their limb dominance between test sessions. Yeah, You can see, if I can get my cursor, one of them here. Favors the right leg in session one, favors the left leg in session two. This athlete's the same. So is this athlete here. But actually, most of them, all favored the same side between test sessions, whether that was the left leg below zero or the right leg above zero. What does that mean? Well, we don't know for certain, but what we said in the article is the drop jump, particularly when you do it on one leg, is a really challenging test. It's very hard. And the harder a test is, it's the harder it becomes to manipulate your strategy to try and achieve the same outcome. And Sean Maloney said in 2016 that asymmetries are best identified from maximal effort tasks. Okay, now the single leg counter movement jump can be a maximal effort task, but because you are, your foot is in contact with the floor, for a much longer period of time compared to the drop jump, you can manipulate your strategy somewhat to try and achieve the best jump height that you can do. A drop jump is much more technically harder, technically demanding. You know, you have to get off the ground as quick as you can. You've got to stay really stiff at the knee, and then you've got to still try and jump as high as possible. 
it's a harder test than the single leg counter movement jump. And it's possible that in a harder test, it's harder to change your strategy or cheat the test, which means what we might see is more truer, a truer reflection of asymmetry in a harder test because an athlete can't cheat it, if that makes sense. So that's something that we spoke about when comparing the single leg drop jump to the single leg counter movement jump. And then what I wanted to finish on really um, before the conclusion slide, two slides now. What that's done is that's gone, well, that's interesting, but it's only in the test retest design. In my PhD, we looked at this longitudinally, okay? So we tested the single leg counter movement jump on force plates, and we measured jump height, peak force, and concentric impulse. And all the values you see here are asymmetry values, okay? We did this in pre-season, mid-season, and end of season, and this is in a professional football. We also did the single leg drop jump test using the opto jump measuring equipment. And we took jump height, ground contact time and reactive strength index as our metrics. <clears throat> so we've got a real nice mixed bag of data here. You know, we've got three metrics per test. We've got a lot of data. And here's our mean asymmetry values for both tests for all these metrics at each time point, okay? Once again, you can see the standard deviations are huge, really, really big, which means even in professional athletes, a more homogenous sample, the within group variation in asymmetry is very, very large. Now, before I release the red and green boxes, just take a look at these scales down here for me, okay? What we did is we wanted to look at whether or not the magnitude of asymmetry significantly changed throughout the season. And then we also wanted to look at the direction of asymmetry, okay? And whether that stayed consistent between measured time points. So we use the effect size scale, okay, plus our you know, repeated measures ANOVA um, to look at the magnitude differences. And we use the Kappa coefficient, which is that scale I just described for the direction of asymmetry. So here are the effect sizes. Okay, um, and to save you time, out of this nine and this nine, the largest effect size values we have are minus 0 0.6 and plus 0 0.55. And if we look at our scale, that basically means that our effect sizes, our differences throughout the season are either trivial or small. So what we wrote in this paper is that this data gives the impression that the magnitude of asymmetry stays relatively consistent throughout the course of a season, but only when using mean data, right? And you just need to look at the raw numbers in the blue here. Just look at them and just, you know, don't worry about the effect sizes for now. If you just say, well, 11.19, 8.61, 8.93. So it drops a bit in mid-season and then it stays very constant. Peak force, 10.49, 6.22, 9.54. Okay, that changes a little bit, hence why we have the biggest effect size values for this metric here. But again, look at the drop jump, 8.42, 10.13, 10.42, 6.38, 6.96, 6.10. These values are not changing much. These mean values look like they're relatively consistent. However, we know that the standard deviation is so big so the mean value suggesting that asymmetry doesn't change much seems like an incredibly flawed concept when the standard deviation is so big. So let's look at the direction of asymmetry now. Okay, we've got this message potentially being conveyed that the magnitude of asymmetry is pretty consistent. But when we look at the direction of asymmetry here, let's take the first one, jump height in a single leg counter movement jump, 0 0.52, 0 0.35, 0 0.77. And just to be absolutely clear, what we're looking at here is if I jumped higher on my right leg in preseason, do I also jump higher on my right leg in midseason? That's what we're looking at, limb dominance effectively. And the answer was we get 0.52. So we get a moderate amount of time. These athletes are favoring the same limb by midseason. 
if we compare pre-season to end of season, that drops a little bit into our fair category. But if we compare the second half of the season, mid-season to end of season, we get substantial levels of agreement. Now let's look at some different metrics. Concentric impulse, 0.07 minus 0.06, 0.33. These values are terrible. Let's look at jump height for the drop jump. 0.2, slight, minus 0.1, poor, and then 0.68, substantial. That's really difficult to know what to do with that, isn't it? This is slight, now it's poor, now it's substantial. It's really fluctuating. So the message in this paper was, well, the magnitude gives this false impression of consistency. And we say it's false because the standard deviation is so large for our results in every metric, in both tests, at every time point. And just as a, as a side note here, I've never seen a symmetry data ever with standard deviation less than 50% of the mean. It's always a very noisy concept. So I appreciate this table is just numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you graphically what this looks like. We're going to compare jump height in the single leg counter movement jump and jump height in the single leg drop jump. Okay. So you will see individual data showing the magnitudes for these two metrics. And we'll compare why these numbers are the way they are across the two tests. Okay. Here's a single leg counter movement jump. What we're looking at here, as you can see, is pre-season, mid-season, end of season, asymmetry data for all 18 players. Now, at pre-season, we started with 32 players. And as is often the case in football, players change clubs and they get injured. And by the time the end of season comes, we actually only had 18 athletes that completed the testing across all three time points. You can see the magnitude varies, not just for each individual, but for each individual at different time points. This athlete here, about 11% pre-season, over 30% asymmetrical mid-season, and then back down to under 20% at the end of season. So you can see how fluctuating it is. Very, very fluctuate, a large fluctuation, sorry, at an individual level. The other thing we're interested in, like we've said before, is how many times do we see three asymmetry bars pointed in the same direction. Remember, above zero, right limb dominant, below zero, left limb dominant. Well, let's count them. One, two, three. This counts because uh, zero, it's something like 0 0.1. You can't see it, but it was positive. So yes, 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 no. Right limb dominant and mid and end of season left limb dominant. No. So there's two, three. Four. Okay, so four out of 18 athletes have fluctuations in limb dominance. So 72% of the time, we get the same limb outperforming the other limb across our 18 athletes. Now let's look at the drop jump, the jump height. Same concept, okay? We're looking for fluctuations, okay, in limb dominance. Right, let's have a look. No, no, no. Yes, there's our first one. Two, no, three, four, five, six, seven, no, eight, nine, ten. Over half our athletes are now have fluctuations in limb dominance for the drop jump test. Okay, so 44% of the time, we're only getting consistency across time points for our athletes. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we get a lot of fluctuation in asymmetry, not just in the magnitude, but in the direction as well. It also tells us that asymmetry is a very task specific. So just because an athlete displays limb dominance in one test doesn't mean they'll display limb dominance in another test. And for anyone who's wondering, we've done that investigation a lot in some of our studies, i.e. we don't compare kappa coefficients between time points We've also looked at kappa coefficients between different tests to see if you favor the right leg in the single leg counter movement jump, do you favor the right leg in the single leg drop jump and change your direction speed? And the answer is very, very rarely. Yeah, so kappa coefficients tend to be very poor, very low values, often below zero actually, between different tests, which again, really highlights 
the task and individual nature, not only of asymmetry, but of limb dominance, actually. Okay. So let's just finish up now. Probably a little bit longer than uh, I was intending, so sorry about that. Um, so asymmetry is a relative concept, and by relative, I mean it's a, it's a percentage. A percentage is a relative concept because a percentage is telling you an imbalance from one thing relative to another. In this case, right limb relative to left limb. Group mean values. Well, we've done about four or five test retest designs, test retest study designs. Uh, and I just showed you a couple of them. And the magnitude of asymmetry very rarely changes between time points or testing. It's the direction of asymmetry that fluctuates more. Okay. So when we've got this false impression of mean asymmetry being consistent, it means we've got to look at an asymmetry on an individual basis. When you see that standard deviation is really large relative to the mean, it means you've got a lot of variation within your group. So we've got to make sure that we look at asymmetry on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> and the direction of asymmetry is really important as well. And, and what we've said is maybe that helps us determine what's true limb dominance and what is perhaps fluctuations in performance variability. And maybe it's those true limb dominance cases, which are the ones that we need to you know, be concerned about. If an athlete is consistently outperforming one limb relative to the other, then maybe that weaker limb, maybe we just need to improve its capacity. And by improving a weaker limb's capacity, an imbalance will probably naturally start to get smaller anyway. Um, okay, that's me done. And I'm guessing if we've got time for any questions, we'll, uh, we can go for